I think that's good. Okay. Do you need the big dress? For the big entrance? Okay. Um, good afternoon. I know. I'll try to lower my voice so the mic works since we're using the mic, although. Um, good afternoon. My name is Amelia Ben-Susan. I'm the chair of the Performing Arts Department here at Emerson College. And, uh, and whether you're here with us in the glorious Cutler Majestic Theater or you are watching us via, let me see if I can get the sentence right. Uh, I have to read my notes on this because you're watching via live streaming on New Play TV. Welcome to everybody. Yes, right? Yay! We're very glad you're joining us. Arts Emerson and the Department of Performing Arts are thrilled that together we can host this event thanks to the generosity of Honey Waldman. Uh, Honey Waldman in, gave us this extraordinary gift of endowing a residency, a guest residency for an artist. And thanks to that gift, we get to share with you one of the most creative voices in this country today. When Honey Waldman founded this res funded this residency, she asked that her gift be used to bring in an artist who would help transform this community. Students, faculty, staff, all of us here at Emerson. She wanted to enliven and transform the students' experience of theater and help all of us see ourselves and our work in a new light. I can think of no better recipient for Honey Waldman's gift than this year's guest. Named one of Time Magazine's 100 Innovators for the Next New Wave, and although I think that was 10 years ago, she's still one of the hottest innovators. <laughs> the winner of a Pulitzer, a MacArthur Genius Award, several Obies, and many other awards. Her numerous plays include Father Comes Home from the Wars, The Book of Grace, Top Dog, Underdog, In the Blood, Venus, The Death of the Last Black Man in the Whole Entire World, Fucking A, Imperceptible Mutabilities in the Third Kingdom, and one of my favorites, The America Play. In 2007, her 365 plays, 365 days, was produced in over 700 theaters worldwide, creating one of the largest grassroots collaborations in theater history, of which Performing Arts at Emerson was one of the contributing organizations. Currently, her adaptation of the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess is continuing its extraordinarily successful Broadway run. I could go on. I recommend you read more about Susan Laurie if you don't already know a lot. I'm sensing a lot of you do and have experience with her work. So I'm going to add really why I think it's extraordinarily special that she's here. Beyond her accomplishments, which are indeed significant, I think what she's bringing to our community and what she brings to all who encounter her and her work is an energy of possibility, of presence, of creativity and voice. In her performance slash installation slash teaching slash act of almost, I would say, public meditation, which she terms watch me work, which she did this afternoon in our community. I think she's helped more writers than we know, more artists than we can imagine. And all of us start paying attention to our own voices. The me in watch me work, I think, becomes you. And when you watch her work, you can then transform it into your own voice and vision. As she told our students today, go and do it. What are you waiting for? So what are we waiting for? It's my great honor to introduce you to this year's Waldman Chair in the Performing Arts, Susan Lloyd Parks. for many, 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 We were artists together in downtown Brooklyn, back when downtown Brooklyn was wild. We had to hack through the underbrush to go to the theater, and the critics, you know, it's like that. But then we would hang out in downtown Brooklyn and make theater 
Um, that was a while ago, and here we are both today at Emerson. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm happy to be the Waldman lecture visiting person. <laughs> we are, we did Watchman work this afternoon. Thanks for giving Watchman work a shout out. We were then, as we are now, live streaming on New Play TV, and it's so exciting to be live. <laughs> it's really good. So, um, and for the, the that occasion, I have, for you, uh, as I told folks, um, I told Rebecca, Frank, and all the people who put this together, it's been really fun so far, and I have some events to do tomorrow also. But I told them that I would be giving you this evening a million suggestions. A million suggestions. Um, first, we're going to, I'm going to do some talking, and then we're going to do some Q&A. If you have any questions, we'll all uh, work to answer them. But I'm going to be giving you a million suggestions in the course of about 40 minutes or so and that's yeah that's that's gonna mean that i'm going to have to make some sounds some very interesting sounds and we've warned the sound department the sound guys the sound people already so when i you're gonna hear something like this when you hear something like this you might if you're tender you might want to cover your ears <laughs> or many suggestions whizzing by you at the speed of sound. Many suggestions will whiz by you just like that. Other suggestions will be told to you like this at the speed of speech. All of the suggestions you will be able to incorporate into your daily life, whether you're an artist or don't consider yourself an artist, you'll be able to incorporate these suggestions into your daily life. Also throughout the evening I'll be doing, I gesture a lot, I've been told I gesture a lot, so I will just tell you what I'm thinking when I'm doing these funny things. This means the text, the text as it is on the page. This means the sidebar or the access road, so I'll be doing that, the margin, you know, just kind of a thought, um, maybe that goes off to a, a tangent. Um, this, when I do this, it means the footnote, uh, you know, like you put a footnote down at the bottom of the page. Um, when I do this, I usually mean the spirit, the higher power, the big field of energy, if you will, the big energy source comes from over there. If you want to talk to me during the Q&A about my tattoos, uh, we can talk about those. Um, this means the past. You know, I say in the past, so Amelia and I used to hang out in Brooklyn, like that. Okay, and then this is the way back past, like when I was in high school, which I will be referring to uh, shortly. So um, you have all those, so when I start moving my hands around, you got it. Okay, you're nodding, yeah, you got it. Okay, okay we're ready to go. So in 2002, I won the Pulitzer Prize for drama, and ever since then, people have been asking me this question, what's it like to be the first African-American woman to win the Pulitzer Prize in drama? And I say, oh man, it's great. That's exactly what I say. It's really great. It's really, really great, and it's also very humbling because, as you know that saying, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and it's very clear to me that I'm up here today very much in part um, because of, there have been some awesome, 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 great, great, great writers who have hacked the path, you know, and built that road so that I could just kind of walk down that road. So I always want to start the speech, if you will, the show, by giving thanks to the people who have come before, people who were back there and also somehow magically in front of me, whose footsteps I follow even though they were made a long time ago. And we all have those kinds of people in our past. We talked today in Watch Me Work about the folks everyone's got behind them, you know, like your own private bench if you're into baseball or, you know, one of those sports like the bench, your deep bench, your people there who are rooting for you. And we always want to acknowledge those people and give thanks to them. Another question people ask me is, when did I start writing? When did you start writing? When did you start writing? And I tell them, as far as I know, I started writing in the fourth grade. In the fourth, you're somewhere like this. I have a son, he's this tall, he's a year and a half. So in the fourth grade, he'll be like this, I guess. Um, <laughs> but I started writing in the fourth grade. And one, just so you know, one can begin at any age to do the thing that you really, really, really want to do. 
There was a great writer, D.H. Lawrence, many of you might have heard of him. He, great, awesome writer, wrote lots and lots of great novels, and then started painting, painting at the age of 40. And he wondered, he said, he wrote, what am I doing bursting into paint? I am a writer, I ought to stick to ink. I have found my medium of expression, so why do I want to try another? Then he said, well, I had to get to age 40 before I got the courage to try. And then it became an orgy, painting pictures. So this kind of ballsy writer had to become 40 before he had the, the courage to try doing something new. I have a good friend who told me that her father was a businessman, retired at age 60, and started writing novels. And now he's 81 and he's got like five published novels. And I was like, oh my God, I have to tell people that because it's just an example. You can start at any time, at any time. Um, if you feel like starting right now, if you've been harboring this desire, you know, this, oh, this is a sign for more, which I do. We, we, you te you're supposed to teach children uh, sign language before they can talk. So if I start doing this, know that I've been talking to a, an 18-month-old person. So if you have the desire to do something more with your life, um, and you get that desire right now, and you feel like, now is my time, right now, right now, right now, begin now. Because what you're going to begin right now for yourself, especially if you've been putting it off for a long time, is more important than anything that I'm going to say to you. Um, as Gandhi says, you know, be the change you want to be, you want to see in the world. And if you feel like starting that, if that change starts happening for you right now, then by all means, begin. But I started writing in the fourth grade. Oh, also, one more note about like doing something. A lot of you are very accomplished people, uh, whether you're in school or professors and everything. It's never a good time to sit on your laurels. I always think that, right? Never a good time to sit on your laurels. I have in my contract, my speaking contract. By the way, this is an awesome uh, circle of light. I just want to give you thanks. <laughs> I, it looks like the ring of fire, for those of you who know that, uh, that song. But I have in my contract um, that I'll have a music stand, a boom mic, and a stool on which I will not sit, because I always think sitting, I equate with like resting on your laurels, so I wouldn't want to give you this speech by like sitting down like this. So, um, it's always a good time to like start doing your thing. I started doing my thing in the fourth grade. My father was in the army, he was away in the war, he comes home and decides with my mom that they were going to uh, you know, get going with their American dream, and their American dream had a soundtrack. And the soundtrack went something like the sound of their children practicing scales on the piano. You know, so they went out and they bought a piano, a baby grand piano, and they put it in the living room and they sat there waiting to hear that sound. Um, we we practiced piano, we had a wonderful piano teacher, several wonderful piano teachers, but mostly we would play outside, and this was in the past when children played outside. Now we don't really see children play outside, but we would, my mom, so my mom would come looking for us and we'd be either, I'd be one of two places, outside playing, running around, playing in the yard or whatever, or one day she found me, she walked, and she said, I was under the piano sitting there with a the dog, the family dog, and she said, what are you doing? And I had my notebook out and a pencil, and I said, I'm writing my novel. <laughs> there I was in the fourth grade writing my novel. I had read at that point two novels and a little bit of another novel. I'd read Harriet the Spy, which is a great novel. I'd read Hotel for Dogs, which is another great novel, not as well known as Harry the Spy. And I'd read At, Don Quixote. My parents had, you know, the illustrated world classics up on the bookshelf. And I pulled one of them down at random, and it was Don Quixote, and it was illustrated. So what I did was I just went through and I read the captions under the pictures. So I had two and an ish novel, right, under my little fourth grade belt, but I felt like it was a good time for me to start writing my own novel, which was a totally far out idea, which brings us to suggestion number one. Suggestion number one, entertain all your far out ideas. 
Entertain all your far out ideas. Now what does that mean? When you get a far out idea, you entertain it, you invite it into your home, you know, sit it down at your table, give it something delicious to eat or drink, whether you're drinking water or wine or Maker's Mark or a Pepsi product. <laughs> you guys like Pepsi products here. Um, let it take root in your life and it will bloom beautifully. You know, you entertain all your far out ideas, let it take root in your life, and it will bloom beautifully. And what's an example of a far out idea? 365 days, 365 plays, which Emerson was a part of, a beautiful part of. Um, I was hanging out one day, and I said, uh, I'm gonna write a play a day. I'm gonna call it 365 days, 365 plays. And I started writing that very day. And then I had a friend of mine, Bonnie Metzger, who's a wonderful, wonderful producer, and she said, hey, what are you going to do now that you've written them? A year later, I wrote them. And we went and did them all over the world. We did them all over for fun, right? So that's an example of a far out idea. So I started writing in the fourth grade. And then what did I do? What did I do? Um, just because obviously I'm standing up here doesn't mean that it was easy, right? Just because, you know, someone has achieved some level of success doesn't mean the road was easy. Often. The road to success is full of lumps and bumps, which is always good to remember. I started writing and I kept at it. I kept at writing and I was fortunate enough to get into um, AP English in high school, which is, I, they say that you, they still have AP English, Advanced Placement English, people are nodding. So you're familiar with that. You're like good at English or something. So I don't know, right? Who, who knows? Um, I was fortunate enough to get into AP English. And what, and this is a long time ago, you understand, when I was in high school. And because I just have to tell you, you those of you who are, like when you were at Watchmen, when were you born? What year? Uh, 1994. 1994. <laughs> wow, amazing. So, no, no, it's cool. That was cool. That was a great year. <laughs> um, <laughs> Here, but 1994, so, but, but I was born at a time, and I was in high school at a time when, like, when you said the word computer, right, that conjured up the image of, you know, a big thing like a, a refrigerator, or bigger, actually, I think. I mean, no one, I've never seen a computer. You'd heard about them on TV. But, um, and, you, and you fed them uh, cards, like that. So nobody had a personal computer. That was like... I don't know, nobody had one. I don't even think they had been invented yet. And what I'm getting to is that we didn't have PCs, personal computers. We also did not have spell check. This is a long time ago. And teachers, at least my teacher, my AP English teacher, used spelling to measure your intelligence, right? That was a common practice back then. So every Monday in AP English, we would get a list of words, and every Friday, of course, you take the list away, and we'd have to surrender the list, I guess. That's how it worked. And we'd have to spell the words. She'd call out the words, and we'd have to spell them. And by that, she'd measure how smart we were, you know. And, yeah. So you've heard of, uh, like, those time periods, like A.D. and B.C., and this is like B.S.C., before spell check. This was a horrible <laughs> time in my life. And Friday started with the letter F for a reason, because every Friday without fail, I failed that test. Every, no matter how hard I studied from Monday to Thursday night, you know, at midnight, Friday would come and I'd fail the test. Um, it has something to do with the English language, but back there, I'm not blaming the English language, I'm just saying it's hard. Um, also, they would say in, the, in those days, sound it out, sound it out. Sound it out. It doesn't work in English. Sound it out does not work in English. But anyway, um, <laughs> Friday went on. Uh, that was still great that little Susan Lord Park Scott. So what happened at the end of the school year, I managed to get into Mount Holyoke College. But at the end of the school year, you're invited into the teacher's office for what I would call a debriefing. You know, you've been sort of. She's sending you out into the world. And she says, well, Miss Parks, um, that's really, really wonderful that you got into, oh, I'm talking like this because she had an overbite. So she talked kind of funny. Um, so she said, uh, you've got into Mount Holyoke College, that's really wonderful. 
Um, what do you plan to do uh, to study in Mount Holyoke College? And I said, well, I'm, I was shy. I'm going to be a, well, I'm going to study English. You know, I didn't want to say I want to be a writer. I just said, I'm going to study English, you know, English literature. And she said, well, English literature. And then maybe I did blurt out, well, maybe I'll be a writer. I couldn't help it. You know, I'm so excited. You know, I wanted some kind of effort, you know, confirmation from her, you know. And uh, she said, well, be a writer, study English literature. That's very interesting. She opens her grade book. Oh. <laughs> You've been there, haven't you? She finds your name. She reads it across. a balloon, right? It shrinks like this. And she says, Miss Parks, um, I don't think you should be a writer because you're not a very good speller. <laughs> and I said, well, yes, ma'am. I, I totally hear you on that one. I was brought up to say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, to folks. And I also had in my back pocket a uh, plan B. I was really, really, really good in science. I was really good in physics. So I thought I'd be the first black woman in space. That was my backup plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're so lucky. That didn't work out. Um, um, Dr. Ida Mae Jimson actually was the first black woman in space. But we're so lucky. But what happened was, you know, so I had this backup plan. I'll just be a scientist, you know. Got it covered. And um, I went to Mount Holyoke College and I had to take chemistry classes. You know, that's like the basic, you know. You have to go and the first thing you have to take if you're going to be a science major is chemistry classes. So we wore these white lab coats and the gloves, you know, and the goggles and the whole bit, right? And we're in the lab and we're, we have this you know, test tubes and whatnot and beakers and you're pouring liquids from one thing to another. And I think, I'm dying. <laughs> this is what it's like to grow up and die. <laughs> right? I don't know. You've been there, you know. It's like, right. So, I mean, not to diss chemistry or anything. Chemistry, biochemistry, everybody's cool, but it wasn't my thing. There I was dying. <laughs> they forced us to take this core curriculum, right? And they forced you. So, you know, they forced you to take an English class. Ha, we're going to torture the science majors by forcing them into English classes. So I was a science major. They forced me to take an English class. We read, among other things, that first semester, we read uh, Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. Has anybody read To the Lighthouse? To the, oh, you've read To the Lighthouse? Can you explain it to me? It was like a beautiful, beautiful poem, and the mystery of it was like, wow, 
You know, I know there is mystery in chemistry also, but it doesn't sing to me like the mystery in literature. And the mystery in literature was totally, totally singing to me in Virginia Woolf's novel. And you know how um, heliotropism, you know, how flowers go, nah. <laughs> That's what happened to me. I went, nah. It turned me back to, no, but it's true. You see, you know, you know nature, don't you? You guys live up here. Like that, all of a sudden, when you hear something or see something that reminds you of who you are, it helps you remember yourself, literally putting your members, your body back together. And Virginia Woolf definitely helped me remember my me. There's this quote, uh, this guy wrote this book, Stephen Pressfield, called The War of Art. And he says, we cannot be anything we want. Our task is to discover who it is that we are supposed to be and work toward fulfilling our destiny. So Virginia Woolf's to the Lighthouse helped me remember myself and her work helped me, like I said, rehear my me. So this brings us to suggestion number two. Now sometimes, it's very important, sometimes somebody who you really respect, who really wants you to do well, who really likes you, will give you some advice. Here they are. So you really respect them and they really like you and they give you some advice and here it comes. That will not jive with what's going on inside you. And when that happens, you say no thank you. All right, so again, you really respect them, they really like you, they want you to do well. And their advice, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you say no thank you. Okay? There's a wonderful yoga teacher, Adil Pakivala, who says, you don't want to spend enormous amounts of energy climbing the ladder to success only to realize that you've propped up the ladder against the wrong wall. So yeah, so I'm talking about spending some time listening in and listening to your own guts and entertaining those, those far out ideas, tuning into your own guts. Um, here, your ears. <laughs> Suggestion number one, two, one, eight. <laughs> practice listening. I didn't say they were going to be in the miracle <laughs> I just feel that. Practice listening. I, I mention this because my whole writing process, pretty much, pretty much everything I've written comes from listening in, a constant and steady listening to my own guts. William Faulkner, the famous writer William Faulkner says, I listen to the voices. And I'm in total agreement with that. People are always asking me, what are your tricks for coming up with ideas? I just like listen. I listen to the world very much. And I also listen in. I listen in. I listen in to what, you know, I entertain these far out ideas constantly, constantly. So we go back to Mount Holyoke College. There I was. I'd fallen back in love with literature. I fled the chemistry lab. I decided that I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know any writers. There were no writers in my family, right? So I was like, uh, there was no money in writing that I could see, you know, the, the budget cuts those days too, and all the same things, same kinds of things that you might be experiencing today as you look out past your graduation. Um, but I thought, no, you know what, this time I'm definitely going to become a writer. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I know that it does involve a lot of writing. So I'm going to write, you know, every day, every day, pretty much as best I can. I made that commitment. Okay, and after many, many, many years of writing, I still make and remake the commitment to being a writer. Okay, and if you are anything, whether you're a writer or a painter or a mom or a dad or a professor or a milkman or whatever, you have to get up in the morning and make the commitment to do your thing, right? And just because you've been doing it a long time, there is no cruise control, especially in the arts, you know, or in parenting for that matter. There's no cruise control. Right? You don't coast, okay? And one thing that happens, one of the th many things that happens when you make that commitment, all sorts of wonderful things start to come into play. You might not notice them, some of them might be really small, but all sorts of wonderful things are coming into play for you. What happened for me is I didn't have to take any more chemistry classes, so that was automatic. Yay, right? Um, and then what happened was I got to spend time reading literature, which I loved, and I got to spend time working on my own writing. 
which was a, a joy to me. It wasn't easy, but it was, it was kind of fun. It was fun. Um, I listened to those writerly voices, you know, the sounds of inspiration, things like that. And then what happened a couple years after that, we heard that James Baldwin, the famous writer James Baldwin, was coming to town. And Mount Holyoke, as you know, probably because you guys live up here, it's in the Pioneer Valley, and there are the five colleges. He was going to teach at Hampshire College, and we could take classes as students at Mount Holyoke College. We could apply to get in that class. So of course, everybody in the whole valley probably applied. The stack of applications, we saw them later, was like way up here. He, everyone sent in a short story or something to try to get into that class. They were only accepting 15 people, three from each college, right? And all we all were probably sitting there, oh, please, 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 pick me, pick me, pick me. Somehow, uh, through the grace of, you know, the higher power I got into his class. There were 15 of us in the class, as I said. We sat around one of those library tables, right, one of those big tables. And we all sat there, and there were some undergrads and some grads that kind of mixed it up with grad students and undergraduates. And we all sat there that first day. I remember, I think it was a Monday or something, uh, before you were born. And I'm like, 10, 12, 12 years before you were born. We were sitting at that library table waiting for him. I had seen pictures of him because my parents, when they found out, ah, oh, I want to be a writer, they gave me some, you know, they gave me one of his books, a couple of his books, The Fire Next Time. There was this picture on the back. Oh, I couldn't wait. We all looked at the door waiting for him. I imagined, of course, he was going to be huge, a big man coming through the door. He wouldn't even fit to the door. He was so amazing, I thought. <laughs> So a couple of minutes after, I think it was like three o'clock, a couple of minutes after three, he comes in. He's a small man, man about my height, right? Thin, fine, fine bone, very fine bone. He has a head that looks like an alien. <laughs> and he has eyes that can see through your best bullshit. <laughs> and he sits at the head of the table and in class with James Baldwin begins. He says he had never taught creative writing before. So we were so fortunate to receive the first fruits of James Baldwin's wisdom on the subject for which he was, you know, he was just known the world over as such, such, such a great writer. So when it was my turn to read, and we were, you know, we got to read about it every other week, every three weeks, something like that, probably the same thing here. And I would stand up, I'd hold my text, I'd read, I'd read aloud, I'd make voices for the characters and do all these kinds of things and gesture a lot and all this. No one else was doing that. I thought needed a little something. My short stories, they needed a little something. And after a couple of times doing this, he called me aside after class and he said, Miss Parks, have you ever thought about writing for the theater? <laughs> and I was like, shit. <laughs> A theater, the theater, there was a theater. I mean, there, I, I had seen the theater people. <laughs> Not really. I mean, I know, you know, the theater people, you know, they, had, they wore funny hats. <laughs> and they were all from the United States. You know, they were all from the States, but they all spoke darling, darling, darling. Like that. Well, that brings us to suggestion number three, because what happened right after that, after I kind of got over that, I had to take the five college bus home, and I started writing my very first play, which does bring us to suggestion number three, which is sometimes, it looks a lot like suggestion number two, sometimes someone that you have a lot of respect for, who really wants you to do well, will give you some advice, blah, 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 that does jive with what's going on inside you. And when that happens, you take their advice. Okay, so you see the difference. It feels right. So you take their advice, right? How do you, again, how do you know the difference between good advice and bad advice? By listening in, by listening in, by listening in. Your ears. <laughs> It's cold. 
told him flu season. Um, <laughs> suggestion number one, two, three, four. Your breath is your divine voice. Take some time every day to listen to it, even if it's just for three minutes a day. <clears throat> Does anybody, uh, I hope somebody out there has a meditation practice. Yes, maybe. Oh, yay! Or raise your hands. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, yes. Oh, good. So two people, maybe. So, so a few more. Great. Great. Fantastic. That's more. I, last week I, I spoke at Duke University and there weren't as many people. So just so you know, you're ahead of them. Um, but uh, fantastic. There is a word, and I, I think I'm using this word correctly. There's a word called neuroplasticity, which basically to me means that you can regroove your brain, you know, like a piece of vinyl, you know, like a record, you know. Um, what you do, you have a meditation practice, and those of you who don't have one and you'd like to try it, you just sit, maybe you can sit on the floor, or you sit in a chair, you set a little timer for yourself, and you know, 10 minutes or five minutes or three minutes, if that's all you can manage, you sit there and you breathe, and you just breathe, and you, are, you become aware of the patterns of your mind. And what you learn to do is you learn to stay with yourself. Oh, so this is what I'm really like. Oh, that's okay. It's basically what it is. Okay? And what you learn to do is any patterns regroove your brain, any patterns that like are not working for you, you can become aware of them and awareness, through awareness you can, you know, alter your behavior if it's not working for you. And accept the things that, you know, of course you can't do anything about. But uh, so that's neuroplasticity and listening in and a meditation practice. Um, so what James Baldwin taught me, James Baldwin, of course, he steered me toward playwriting. He also taught me how to conduct myself in the presence of the Spirit. How to conduct myself in the presence of the Spirit. And what does that mean again? These foreign ideas. You are welcoming to the Spirit. You entertain your foreign ideas. You treat the Spirit as an honored guest. Right? You are respectful as you would be in the presence of a great and powerful volcano. Because the Spirit is at least that. And you are attentive to the Spirit as you would be attentive to a lover. How to conduct yourself in the presence of the Spirit. How to value your life, basically. Right? Taught me how to value my, my life and my art, too. So fast forward really fast. <clears throat> I graduated from college. Moved to London to hang out. Moved to New York. I didn't go to grad school. I kept thinking I would go, but I kept doing something else instead. When I moved to New York uh, with a degree from Mount Hood College in English and German literature, I had no what they call marketable skills. And so I had to take a class, a uh, series of classes at um, the Betty Owen Secretarial College. And they taught you to type really fast. It was really, really cool um, to be able to type that fast. And what happened was I could then get jobs, you know, as a temporary word processor. And I would go to work, you know, nine to fives in places like the World Trade Center and Citibank and on Park Avenue and all those fancy places and lawyers' offices and things like that. And I would save my money. And then in the evening, still dressed in my, well, because I had one outfit that was considered corporate, you know, which was this kilt. Women back then wore kilts. These like, you know, things. They weren't cutesy kilts. They were kind of dorky kilts. Um, and uh, I would wear this and I would go after work, I would go and hang out with my friends who all hung out in the East Village and they all were black and they all wore, you know, sunglasses even in the middle of the day and they wore like berets. It was something out of a, you know, French movie or something. Um, and they all smoked unfiltered cigarettes and drank absinthe and the whole thing. And so they, they would kind of look at me when I walked in. I don't know what. They were all working in fat, cool, groovy jobs, but I was working at this bank, and they would, I'd walk in to hang out with them, and they would look me over and say, oh gosh, you know, you're never gonna be an artist because you're not cool. And I would say, okay. So I saved my money. I saved my money. What I did do is I wrote a lot when I went home, right? I would go home to my little apartment and write and write and write and write. And I saved some money. I wrote a little play. I got enough money to hire uh, uh, an act, uh, two actors and a director. And I was like, I want to do this play somewhere. There was a place in the East Village called the Gas Station, which had been, back in the day, a gas station. 
And it's cool, right? So uh, they had taken up the pumps, obviously, and in this room, which was like a cement floor, there were there's a little bar and some Christmas lights, the only lights in the place, and a green couch on which all kinds of things happened. And we would go and hang out there late at night, me and my cool artist friends, we would go and hang out and we would watch the lights go blink, 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 blink. And one night I said, hey guys, you want to do a play here? You ever thought of that? And they were like, actually no, we'd never thought of that, but we'd love to do a play here. Uh, we'll go out and buy the chairs, and you go out and buy the lights, and we'll put on your show. Because I'd written this play, I had money to hire folks and pay people, so I was like, great. So I went to the hardware store and bought some silver clip-on lights and two or three long yellow industrial strength extension cords. And we hired the actors, we had the rehearsal, we made little flyers, they passed them all around the neighborhood. It had a run of my show, Betting on the Dust Commander, had a run for three days, a three-day run, which was standard for an off, 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 we were so far off Broadway, we may as well have been in another country, and we probably were. Um, three people, three or four people came. My mom, my dad, my sister, and the homeless man who lived outside. Because it was warm, because it was like October, you know, and so he came in and watched the show, bewildered, as I'm sure my parents were, bewildered. Because it was, you know, you know, off, 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 Broadway, theater, it was cool, it was weird, it was strange, it probably made no sense to them. Uh, I sat, during the show, I sat behind a screen, and my, I was in charge of the lights, and I held those extension cords, and lights up was this, and lights down was this, and I did this for the whole show, as the show ran. I thought I had arrived, I really felt like I had arrived. I was a playwright in New York City. I had made a little bit of money through my temp job to hire actors. I'd written a play. I'd got a venue to produce the play. And there I was, so very proud that I had, as my dad said, made my own luck. Suggestion number 7,777, my dad would always say this, you make your luck. So the idea isn't that you're, you're not sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. You're out there doing it. And again, I had this theory that if you put some effort into it, the spirit will meet you halfway. You know, the spirit will meet you halfway. So as my dad said, you make your luck. And then, of course, came wonderful experiences like Baca downtown because I had put a lot of energy into it. Um, Imperceptible Mutabilities in the Third Kingdom won the Obie for Best New American Play. More plays came, Venus in the Blood, screenplays like Girl Six for Spike Lee. Uh, more plays, Top Dog Underdog, if you want to talk about that during the Q&A. Fucking A, 365 Days, 365 Plays. A novel I wrote called Getting Mother's Body. Um, <laughs> Overrated, and besides, you will miss all the fun. <clears throat> These suggestions are from the old school, from the movement, from the civil rights movement. Uh, suggestion number nine, each one, teach one. Suggestion number 12, lift others as you climb. So when you're climbing the ladder to success, make sure you have your hand out to help others in their ascent also. Suggestion number 63, eyes on the prize. Suggestion number 144, ain't nobody gonna turn me around. Ain't nobody gonna turn me around. One of my favorites, suggestion number 47, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. So I wrote Top Dog Underdog in three days. <clears throat> Maybe you've heard that story. Um, I don't trip on that fact. I have this theory that what you trip on will trip you up. 
So we can talk more about Top Dog Underdog if you want to in the Q&A. The novel, Getting Mother's Body, I wrote while we were in rehearsal for Top Dog Underdog. So I'd written a couple of drafts, and we got our theater on Broadway, the Ambassador Theater. I knew nothing about Broadway theater at the time. Um, I got a call from my agent saying, hey kiddo, we're gonna do Top Dog on Broadway. I said, yeah, yeah, I know, George said he wants to direct it, okay. Okay, and he said, we got the Ambassador. And I said, the Ambassador of what? <laughs> I knew nothing about Broadway theater. The Ambassador is a theater on Broadway, who knew? Now I know, okay. But back then I did not know. Um, so we were in rehearsal at the Ambassador for Top Dog Underdog, George Seawolf directing, most Steph, and Jeffrey Wright uh, as Lincoln and Booth. And I'd been working on this novel for a couple of years, and something inside me, again, a far out idea, it said, push, push. I was like, what does that mean? It said, I knew that I had to get the novel done, a readable draft, before we opened Top Dog Underdog. Just something in me told me, get it done now, don't wait. So we would rehearse all day, and I would go home, I lived in Brooklyn at the time, I would go home and write into the night on this novel. I'd write as many pages as I could. I finished the novel the day before we opened Top Dog Underdog. We opened Top Dog Underdog, on a, I finished the novel on a Saturday, we opened Top Dog on a Sunday, and on that Monday, they announced the Pulitzer Prizes and I won. And the sound was like this. It's really hard to write when you hear that sound. Right? So many eyes upon you. I was so glad that I had finished my novel, that I had listened to that inner voice and I had finished my novel before that Monday came. It's a very heavy moment. Suggestion number 866. Write a play a day. No. Write a play a day. Either you can do something crazy like 365 days, 365 plays, or you can think of what do I want the world to be like? I think I want the world to be like this. And you go into your life every day, and you are the star of your own play. And that is the action of your play that day. So today my play would be called Visiting Emerson. And this, and oh, and, and we have a special appearance by Ralph Waldo Emerson, even though they're not the same. <laughs> but he'd come on and say something like, um, I am a god in nature, I am a weed by the wall. He'd say like that or something, because I think Raven said that. Something cool like that. And we have this play. Um, but write a play a day. Make, make your life a series of beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plays. See what's missing in the world and fill it in. Uh, find that way to fill in some of the action that's missing in the world. <laughs> I have to go back a page. Suggestion number 9260, smile at your fear. That comes from Pema Chodra and the fabulous Buddhist nun. Smile at your fear. You find yourself cringing at something you're afraid of. She, she suggests that you smile instead. And she suggests that all those beautiful statues I went to uh, Cambodia recently, and you see these beautiful statues of these deities smiling. And she wonders if they were smiling at something that was very frightening and terrifying. So smile at your fear. It really can change your mind and your mood. Suggestion 888,888. Practice radical inclusion. Practice radical inclusion. <clears throat> I have to do this, the visual. So most of our inclusion is like this. That's our friends, right? We meet our friends. We do something like this. Radical inclusion is your hand is past your shoulder joint. Yeah. This is saved for people who are not like you. It's a spiritual exercise to see yourself in the other. It's very hard to do. Very, very hard to do. Um, what you could do if you have a television or uh, a uh, computer, you can practice it with an image online. You can dial up, you know, you can look up somebody who you don't like. Well, who, who knows? We won't mention any names. But you can just ah, 
see parts of yourself in them and parts of them in you. Because that's often, you know, you know that saying, that's often what we don't like about somebody. What we really, 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 really don't like about somebody is a part of ourselves that we're trying really hard to hide. So it's just a fun spiritual exercise. And then you can maybe, you know, turn it off and go, bah, bah, bah. but, you know, it's a good spiritual exercise. <laughs> Suggestion number 99, when you get an award, regardless of the specifics of the award, know that you've been called upon to contribute to the amount of kindness and compassion in the world. Lots of people, when they get an award, you see them um, looking at the bottom, you know, like this is... Because they think that the fine print says, and now it gives, this is my license to be an asshole. And you see them using their award to, to beat other people or to make other people feel bad, you know, badly. Um, but actually your award, the fine, fine print, is that you've been called upon to increase the amount of kindness and compassion in the world. For those of us who are prized, and all of us here are prized. If you've made it this far, you're prized. No doubt in my mind. If you've made it this far, you are prized. And for those of us who are prized, know that we have been called upon to increase the kindness and compassion in the world. The more you got, the more you got to give, right? The more all that you are, the more all that you have to give and to share. Suggestion number 12,293, you are an ambassador of your race. That's an old school concept that we can bring forward. Way back in the day, my parents, when I was, we were living in places like Germany, where they hadn't seen actually in the flesh a lot of black people, right? My parents would say, you're an ambassador of your race, because they would go, oh, guck mal da, and that, and go, whoa. I'm your first black person that you've ever seen. You're an ambassador of your race. And so we bring that idea forward, and we should all know that we are, an each of us, an ambassador of the human race, right? You're all representing. So what are you bringing? What are you bringing to the table? You know, you're, when I meet you, it's the first time I have met you. What are you bringing to the table? How are you informing my opinion of your world and where you're coming from? Suggestion number 555,291. Always realize the value of kindness. Always realize the value of kindness. Suggestion number one million, which is enjoy the trip. Enjoy the trip, enjoy the trip. So now I'll take your questions if you have any. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? I'll repeat them into the microphone so we, we can uh, hear them. Yes. This is like kind of a satisfy my curiosity kind of thing. A satisfy my curiosity kind of thing. When you when you wrote that play in three days, did you edit along the way or was it like a I write this whole thing and now I'm gonna edit it after? Yes, when I wrote Top of Ender Rock in three days, did I edit along the way or did I go what? Yeah, that's your it. words. Uh, and I'll edit it like yes, I went. I'll edit it later. Yes, yes, yes. It does. It does. Um, speed. Speed is key. Speed is key. I tell my writing students, I teach at NYU, and I tell my writing students that there are two kinds of, of bravery. We need an artist, the bravery of writing and the bravery of rewriting. Two kinds of courage, actually. So the first courage is to get it down, right? And the second courage is to edit skillfully and without mercy. <laughs> yeah, but definitely. I, divide, I tend to divide the two. I feel like when we mix the two, you know, Makes it more difficult. Yes, right there. What's the story behind your tattoos? The story behind my tattoos. <laughs> it means there. It's the same phrase three times. My tattoos, and it. <clears throat> pardon my, my Sanskrit pronunciation is lousy, but I'm going to say it anyway. It says Ishvara Pranadhanani Ra, which is um, from the Yoga Sutras. It's Sutra number one, two, three, which I think is kind of funny. 
and it's where a watch should be. It's three times small, medium, and large. I was going to get extra large, maybe next week. And it means basically uh, the tough translation of Ishvara Pranayava is submit your will to the will of God. The gentle translation is go with the flow. So when I say, what time it is, it's time to go with the flow. Okay, so it's a joke. It's just like a little thing that keeps me laughing. <laughs> I got them done in LA. I was thinking I'd get, a, get you know, one more. <sighs> really big letters, go with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to constantly entertain yourself. You know, life and arts, you have to constantly be like, boom, boom, yes, to the lighthouse. Ah. Ah. Uh, back in January, I randomly went to the public theater. Um, they were having a little get together and they were music. And I thought that was really, oh, yes. really cool. Yes. Um, so I just kind of wanted to hear about your thoughts about making music and maybe the correlation between languages and music and then like music. Oh, you're so smart. You're so smart. I don't know. All I know is that um, I've been playing music as a side bar, side car for a long time. And I'm doing more and more and more and more of it, you know, as, as uh, I go forward. Um, it just makes sense to me. A lot of things I write are, um, they're not musicals without music, but they are really influenced by music. I mean, the, the music is very, very much the sort of foundation of, of the plays that I write. And you can, I've often written <clears throat> drafts of plays that are, the words are all wrong, but the rhythm is right. So I just take out the words and write new words to the same rhythms, you know, of the words that were there initially. So just music is important and, and <laughs> more, more, more music, more, more, more. <laughs> Thanks for asking, I will. Yes? Uh, whenever you're coming up with In the Blood and Public Age, you want them to be conjoined or you purposely write them as separate entities? I love that word, conjoined. Conjoined at the, the hip. Conjoined. Where would they be conjoined? <laughs> So here's the story. Yeah, I told, I told you, I, I talk about the story of, of the birth of, of fucking eight in the blood. I was in a canoe, not far from here, in uh, Nantucket or something, I think. Uh, well, you're laughing, but it's true. I was in a canoe. It was a long time ago, but I was in a canoe. And we were paddling along, and um, I uh, was with a, a friend, I think it's a professor. Oh, she's a professor at Brown now. Anyway, she was also at Baca downtown. Uh, we were paddling along, and I said to her, I was in the back of the canoe, she was in the front, and I said, I'm going to write a riff on the scarlet letter. I'm going to call it fucking A. <laughs> she didn't laugh. <laughs> That's Susan Laurie, weirdo. Um, so we get back to land and, you know, you know, the mud under your feet and pulling the canoe ashore and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, hey, that's not a bad idea. You know, it still makes sense. I'm still interested in it. You know, what do I got to do to write it? Well, first I got to read the scarlet letter. <laughs> My point. And then I, I read the Scarlet Letter and I set out to write this riff on the Scarlet Letter called Fucking A, not an adaptation, a riff. Right? Okay, so I write this thing and I, I'm now, it's like a couple years past, I've written like four drafts and they're all really long and they all feature a character named Hester and a whole bunch of other events that really have nothing to do with the Scarlet Letter. And I finally hit the, hit the wall and went, okay, I've got like four drafts and it's not working. It's just not working. It's not coming together. What do I do? Oh, she has a guitar. <laughs> oh, with your guitar, you should come up and play something. <laughs> it's a guitar, a guitar. Anyway, I'm sorry. Ooh, tangent. Easily distracted. Um, but so I, I, I say to the, the drive, okay, you're not working, you're not working. So I'm sitting at my computer and I say, I'll start at the end and I'll just delete everything that's not working. Because again, there's the courage of writing and there's the courage of, of, of rewriting or editing. So I edit without mercy and I've got my sword of discrimination. And I'm cutting, I'm deleting, click, 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 click delete, all the way up. We get all the way to page one, the DP page, the, dr the dramatic, you know, the characters in the play. Delete, 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 delete. Hester, I get to Hester, she's the first character. She's not working. Delete. 
and I hear a voice, you know, the, the, the delete pile, you know, things are deleted and they're thrown over to this side. And I hear a voice from Hester saying, why did you cut me from the play? And I said, because you ain't working, bitch. <laughs> So the next thing to cut, of course, is the title, fucking A, and I'm like, oh, but that still works. And she said, I said, but I don't know what the story is. And she said, I have a story for you. And I said, oh, what is it? And she went, Poof. and in seconds, I had a whole, oh, it's a, mo a homeless mother of five. And her five kids are played by five adults who are also in her life. She talks about the hand of fate that blocks out the sun. I typed it, I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool, but that's not fucking A. And she's like, no, no, it's in the blood. <laughs> I was like, oh. So I went ahead and wrote in the blood. And then I wrote fucking A, which is a totally different play. <laughs> so they're not, you know, they're not twins, or they are, or they're, you know, they're, they're related. They both have Hester in them, you know, Hester Smith and Hester La Negrita, you know, you know, in the blood is more to do with, you know, that, she has her own story, fucking A is more about revenge, and how it burns you up, you know, and ruins your life. And these plays have, you know, they really don't have much to do with the Scarlet Letter, although it was the springboard, you know, and a very loved, much loved springboard. So, that's how they were born. Is the story. Yes, behind you, yes. Um, you encourage us to indulge in our own thoughts and our own stories a lot. Um, like you said, to fill in parts of our own life and like play a day. But how do you make that transition to creating um, generous works of art for other people versus more, I guess, selfish or indulgent things? Right, Maybe right. I understand. So I, on one hand, I'm talking about entertaining all your far-out ideas and listening to your own, listening in and listening to your own voices and William Faulkner, listen to the book, but listening to your own voice and listening in and write a play a day through your own life. And how do you turn that around and make it something that will be generous to the world? That's a really great question. I believe. This is a belief, this is, you have to go out on faith on this one, and this is one of my beliefs, that if you are truly specific about your own life, through your own life, you will serve the whole world. I feel that that's the best way to do it, okay? Now that doesn't mean, when I say I write about myself, then this is how I define myself. Now, I think Shakespeare, because I like him, like D-W-M, dead white male guy, okay. But he wrote about himself, but, he was not, you know, Lear and Hamlet and Richard III and Henry VI, right? But that was him speaking through all those, you know, he was using them all as mouthpieces. So when I write Hester La Negrita or Top Dog Underdog, I can't say that's my actual personal experience. No, but I write through myself, okay? And I think to be, so you see yourself in everybody. That's this exercise and you see everybody in you. And that's a complete act of you know, selfishness, but you see the whole world in your eye. You see your eye in the whole world. Myself, the big S. You know, so that's how I, so, it, so it's not a, I'm gonna write a story about, you know, it's, it's not the small S, it's the big S. It's the generous giving, all giving self that I, that I encourage us to write from. It's a good question. Okay, but by really, really, really mining your own truth. That's what the world needs, I think. And you will serve the world. You, will, you can't not write about the whole world if you write about you. Hmm? Yes, in the back. Hello. Hello. Good evening. So happy you're here. Thank you. I'm happy to. Getting ready to leave us, mm -hmm. and, um, and and here you 
were really the younger generation speaking to to to, the, to, to a, a master, you're a master yourself, but you know what I mean. And um, and then you also have you also carry um, Mr. Baldwin mm -hmm. with you through that experience of being his, his student. And and now generationally you are in in, in their realm as far as you know living great um, black writers, black women writers, so on and so forth. How do you, with, with your theatrical pedigree, I don't know how to use that word, but how do you see the way, what do you think of how black writers are, where, where, where black writers are taking their place in American theater and American literature? You know, where, where they're ending up, where their body what do you think about, or do you think about where your body of work is ending up? And how much of the piece, the, the instructions that you gave that are based on the civil rights, you know, influence what you think of where black writers like all women just the most in itself, you know, the grace are ending up in America, in America. Yeah, like, like where, you know, we've come from so much and where are we going kind of thing, right? I mean, I'm just yeah. to quickly summarize, it's beautiful. Yeah. But thanks for the things that you, you were saying. I think it's a really exciting time for all writers, but black writers, I mean, really, when I talk about where we've come, you know, from where we've come before, the folks who have hacked the path, people like, you know, Lorraine Hansberry and Itazaka Shange and Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Wilson and Ed Bullens and Adrian Kennedy and all, you know, Countless others, countless others, countless others. People who've hacked the pack, but for all of us, not just, you know, we make the mistake to think that black writers are only hacking the path for other black writers, or that Shakespeare only hacks the path, you know, opens up a path for white men. You know, I, I, and I sort of key into that. We can all, we're specific in our own groups, yes, and Hopefully, we can grow to believe that any opening is an opening for all of us, right? So it's a, it's a wonderful time for us. And still, there's the glass ceiling, you know what I mean? Still, there are limitations. Still, if you're, if you're a so-and-so from a certain group, it is harder to get your plays done in anywhere. Yes, that is true. And yet, you know, and still we rise. You know what I'm saying? We have to work harder to get the same stuff as you know, we have to work harder than other people, yes, and still we rise. So it's a wonderful thing that we have more people to look at. I used to, when I started doing these talks, people would ask me things like, what do black women think about? I'd be like, I'd be like, well, there's Oprah to the left, and there's Condoleezza to the right, and there's a whole bunch of folks, you know, so never does, you know, what do white women from wherever think about? What do white men from wherever? I mean, we don't do that. We shouldn't be doing that. Um, what do people from Boston think about? Well, there's all kinds of neighborhoods in Boston, so you wouldn't want to just ask one. But it's a wonderful time, I think, for, for all artists, and it's also a difficult time. Maybe more difficult than it used to be, because the, the, the rules are, uh, the, the game is more subtle now. The game is much more subtle. There are those of us who have risen through the cracks and the ranks, and there are still those of us who, who, who are in despair, you know? There are those of us who are succeeding, there's a president in the White House, and there's still people in despair. And that's on every level, in every field. You know, so it's a beautiful time. It's like, you know, Dickens said, the best of times, the worst of times, I think, for writers and for everybody. Oh. <laughs> yes. How do, I, how do you edit? How do you edit? It's a great question. So it sounds like you're probably pretty good at getting it down on the page, right? I'm assuming you're talking about your own writing. And then how do you edit? It's, you find, you feel, it's a feel thing, right? It's a feel thing. And you try to feel where the story wants to go. And we talked about this in Watch Me Work a little earlier today. If you want to go, say, from Boston to Santa Monica, that's your line. 
And if you find yourself continually moving out and going to Greenland, you might have to cut the little Greenland bit, okay? And, and put it in another play, and put it in another work, right? So you try to really feel where your story wants to go, where your play wants to go, and have the bits adhere to that journey, right? Okay, and that's basically what I do. I just, and I don't mind cutting. Um, it makes me very popular with, with uh, directors. <laughs> they always look at me, you're gonna cut that? I'm like, yeah, cut it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't care, if it doesn't fit, hey, why do I wanna sit, why do I wanna sit through it and listen to it more than once, you know? So just cut and know that it'll, it'll come back if it's meant to be in something. Yes? When you're writing a play, do you ever have the experience of uh, the characters kind of taking on minds of their own and kind of like just ha taking their own course within your, within your imagination and it's as if you're not in control, kind of? Yes, he asked, um, do writers, do I have the, have had the experience of writers, uh, the, the characters sort of have minds of their own, you know, and they'll take their own course or horse? <laughs> you know, and they'll gallop off and do things kind of, wow, I didn't know you were doing that kind of thing. All the time, all the time. And that's William Faulkner, I listen to the voices. Characters with enough energy, they will start to inform you about what's going on. It's like a two-year-old. Oh, he's like, oh, he's just a sweet little baby. No, no. You know, they'll start doing their own thing, right? And that's, they're coming into their own. And the best thing you can do is listen to them. Because I think they know, well, I often think they know more than you do. And so again, keep the line, you know, we are going to Santa Monica from Boston and see how they will adhere to that. And sometimes, maybe they'll take that route to Greenland. Maybe it's where you gotta go. Maybe not, you have to pay attention, you know? But oh, definitely, all the time. Yes? Have you ever tried to write yourself? Have I ever tried to write myself, like correct? No, like make a character that is new. This is what I'm doing right now. You haven't noticed? <laughs> <laughs> they, like write myself, like, make a character. Like in a script, like, put a character that, like try and write yourself down in the script. Are you, is that what you're trying to do now? Um, no. No? No. <laughs> no, why do you ask them? <laughs> um, I'm just, yeah, I have tri I've tried to write me. Yeah, I, um, the writing, the, have I ever tried to write myself or put myself as a character in a play? I do, and when I say I, that's what I'm doing right now, that is what I'm doing right now. That, I mean, so this is how I do it. Yes, I do it. It's not a conventional play. It's a play where there's no fourth wall and we do interactive things with the audience and watch me work is another kind of show where I'm playing Susan Lord Parks and actual work gets done. So, I, so that's kind of how I do it, and then we had to talk to the audience to break down the fourth wall to make it look as real as possible. Yeah, so yes, but it doesn't look like a, you know, a, a sort of conventional play. It looks like a non-traditional play. Definitely. It looks like a life. Looks like. <laughs> Hold a mirror up to nature. Yes, sir. Do you, or when do you feel beholden to producibility? Does it ever limit you? cast size or what you can and can't do on stage Right, right, right. Do I feel beholden to producibility? Um, too many characters can't produce that or too big a set shouldn't produce that. I don't worry about it too much, although I do write with a show in mind. You know, we have a show, The Father Comes Home to the Wars plays. I just finished parts one and two, so now we have parts one, two, and three. We're going to do them at the public theater and we're going to do a reading and then another reading and then we're going to kind of march along. Um, the cast configuration is very interesting at this point because we have uh, a lot of folks in it and some people only appear for little bits of the show and we'll see what happens, you know. I mean, hopefully the budget can accommodate that or maybe I'll come up with a rewrite to make them all like one person. I'll do it all. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I don't worry about it too much. Mo the main thing is tell the story, you know, tell the story the way it needs to be told. And we'll find some way to produce it. Not everything has to be produced in a grand manner either. You know, 365, you know, was done very much on the cheap. So I believe in cheap theater too. Not poor, cheap. <laughs> cheap, cheap.
Oh, okay, okay. We'll take, we'll take one more and then we'll go. Yes! Oh, people pointing to you. Yes! What does success mean to me? Uh, there's a cheer. I used to be a cheerleader when I was a child. S-U-C-C-E-S-S. -S -S, that's the way we spell success. Mm, uh, 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 mm, uh, uh, uh. Um, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's, it's sort of getting through the day. It, it's sort of getting through the day in a good way. No, really, it really is because because once you start thinking, I have, I have done, you know, all that's behind you, and really, it's dealing with the present moment in a beautiful way and making the present moment, making right now, lovely for as many people as you possibly can, and that's what success is for me. And as long as I'm able to continue to do that in the present moment, lovely, then I'll feel like. Ah, you know, and we say, um, that's, that brings us to suggestion number one million and one, actually. I was in Myanmar or Burma, you could, I think, say either one now. And we, um, I was doing some writing stuff. They did, they were one of the groups that did 365. And years later, I went to visit them. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. And we were talking, I kept saying, um, when we write, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. We say thank you to the spirit. We say thank you to our community. And we say thank you to ourselves. And, they, and I kept doing this the whole two weeks I was there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And they said, wait, 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 Susan Laurie, we say the same thing. We say thadu, thadu, thadu. Because they're Buddhist, right? So they, they, they don't do the gesture. They say thadu, thadu, thadu. And so that's what we'll say today. Thadu, thadu, thadu. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But thanks for going to go. Okay. <laughs>